Hey everyone, welcome back to the Stride Power Podcast. As always, my name is Evan. Today, we are talking with Liam Bradley and talking all about Liam's success story, learning a little bit more about his running. And we are going to take a deep dive into hearing about his running accomplishment and his running and overall training journey. Liam, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Evan. How are you? I am fantastic. I always love to read about the different stride success stories and just success stories of runners in general, but I am very, very pumped to be able to talk to you and hear personally from you all about your accomplishments and how you got into running and a ton of different things that we're going to cover today. First off, I would like to just ask you what your success story is was with stride running with power and how you would kind of describe that in sort of a short form order before we dive into all those details in this podcast. Sure. Um, by adding stride to my training regimen and my race strategies, I broke sub two in my half marathon for the very first time, cutting five minutes off of my completion time of the Austin half marathon. Fantastic. That Two hour barrier is something that a lot of people can identify with because it is, um, you know, that round number. It's something oh, yeah. where it has, yeah, it's two hours flat. You can kind of say, oh, half marathon, 13.1 miles, two hours. But being like one second on either side oh, totally yeah. defines a whole training block and then a whole race, too. Oh, yeah. right? Absolutely. Um, when I ran last year, it was my first, it was my first half marathon ever. Mm -hmm. And not running with stride, I went into it totally blind. I really had no idea what to expect. And I mismanaged a lot of the hills in the back half. And there was one hill right at mile 12. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Austin Marathon course or not. At mile 12, there's a hill going up and field at Lamar. It's called The Wall. And I came to it last year and I knew that I was just barely off pace for two. And I saw it and my eyes lit up and my legs just said, there's no way this is happening. And so I walked up that hill and I finished in a 201 and change. And it was just so demoralizing when that happened. Um, but in comparison, this year I added stride not long after that. And so going into this race, I had a very clear idea of what my critical power was going to be. I had a very clear race strategy of I wanted to run at 226 watts. Um, and I was able to use the notifications on my watch and it let me know when I was you know, burning myself out, going out too hard. And so when I came up on that same hill this year, I crested the hill before it and the hill came into view. And I thought, oh, that doesn't look that bad. And so I just kept my legs moving and I got up it and I finished in a 157 and change. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I have a few questions uh, because peeling back the curtain here a little bit, uh, we talked just a little bit about your past training buildup um, a few days ago. And I was, I don't want to say very surprised, but your uh, like lifetime, uh, you know, like of running training is relatively short. Um, and last year was the, um, you know, your first half marathon was when you were relatively new to running and training. Can you talk a little bit more about how you got into running and then also triathlon is something you're very, very big into. Can you give us a little bit of a background for you there? Oh, yeah. When I when I said that the Austin half last year was my first half marathon, um, not only was I new to running, but I was new to endurance sports in general. Um, in late 2019, I my previous fitness regimen had grown stale and I wanted something that was a little bit different. And so I had this married couple that was a friend of mine. Um, and the guy is a cyclist. He rides with MS. And so he wanted to recruit me onto his team for the bike MS, Texas MS 150. Um, the lady is a runner. She 
she would place in her age group in events. She was training, going. For, she went was going for her BQ. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he was thinking, oh, well, you should take up cycling. And she was saying, oh, you should take up running. And just in a fit of desperation, I looked at them and I just said, well, why don't I just take up swimming too and just do triathlons? Now, I never knew how to ride a bike. I never learned as a kid and I didn't know how to swim. And I hadn't run since high school, which was 30 plus years ago. But one thing led to another, and that's exactly what I did. Um, so I got a cheap bike from Walmart, and I rode it until it fell apart, and then I got a nicer one. Um, then COVID hit, and well, shortly before that, when right before COVID hit, I joined the Austin Triathlon Club, and they had a very nice program for new triathletes called the New Triathlete Program. And I follow that program and then COVID hit. And a lot of people just naturally phased out because, you know, a lot of the group training was being canceled. A lot of events were being canceled, Um, but I stuck with it. And one thing led to another, and that's kind of what brought me here today. So I'm new to all of this still. What would you say is one of maybe the biggest like learning experience you've had because triathlon is multiple disciplines, right? Oh, yes. So practice a ton of technique in the pool. And then on the bike, you have to deal with, yeah, maybe getting as aerodynamic as possible or getting yes. really good at holding a, a really specific wattage. Then on the run too, um, you know, you can pace with pace and distance, heart rate, power. There are multiple, multiple ways that people mm-hmm. go about it. But um, what are, maybe a thing about each of the disciplines that you felt like you really learned or a lesson you learned about each that really, really surprised you? Um, The one thing that surprised me most is the importance of a strong core in all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, Just in swimming alone, a strong core prevents you from being noodly in the water. It keeps things tight. And I knew that going in, but the importance of a tight core in cycling and even in running, I never really understood that until I got into it. Um, But the importance of a good support network as well, um, because when I first took up triathlon, before that I was into um, group activities. And so I looked at this and I was thinking, oh, finally, something I can do by myself. And then I realized that you never go into these kinds of events in a vacuum. You always have your friends, your family, your um, support crew, coaches. Um, There's just so many other people involved in getting you to the starting line and then getting you to the finish line. Um, And it's important to have all of that in place. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned something I thought was very, very interesting because uh, as people might know if they watch our YouTube or social media or they listen to podcasts before. Um, Anytime we talk triathlon, I typically defer to other people at Stride because I am very, um, you know, relatively experienced with with running. But uh, anytime you add the two wheels or swimming um, in there, I kind of cower away. Uh, But the importance of that first foundational program to teach you some of those techniques and kind of get you familiar with it kind of segued almost into giving you that support network around not, yeah, just your running, but your biking, your swimming and stuff. Can you talk maybe about how that made you consider getting coaching and how maybe that transition happened too? Because um, in our previous uh, conversation, we went into some some great detail uh, just about the coaching and kind of how you found that. Can you talk a little bit about your your coaching experience and yeah. um, maybe how you decided that you were ready to, to find a coach? Um, absolutely. I Like I said, I started with the Austin Triathlon Club and their new triathlete program. And one nice thing about that was that they provided a very structured program to follow as far as this is what you need to do on the bike, this is what you need to do on the swim. Um, And it was 
the coach that we had, her name was Carrie, you know, very nice, you know, very good coach. Um, she also works for another company called Purple Patch Fitness. And one thing that I found as I got into the triathlon training was that I really appreciated the structure that all of this provided. Um, and so once the new triathlete program ended and I realized that I still wanted that kind of structure, at that point, I signed on with Purple Patch. And they still provide the same kinds of things. They still have the baseline training program that I continue to follow. They have race builds that when you have a race eight weeks away, they will change your training for you so you can build up to it. And if you need that kind of structure, then a program like this works very well. Yeah, absolutely. The thing that I'm curious about, too, is that, you know, a lot of the runners um, that have run for almost all their adult life, if not into middle school, high school, have a very good familiarity with the concept of pace, because that's usually when you start out running it, even if you don't have a GPS watch, you can maybe map out how you know far you ran, how long how, how long it took you. Uh, if people have used heart rate before, Stride, relatively new. Running power to not just Stride, uh, relatively new. But you said after your first half marathon, uh, where that hill came up right at the end, oh, yeah. and you were just on the other side of the two hour barrier. It wasn't long after that that you started incorporating running power. And yes. so my question to you is what made you consider running with power and training with stride? Well, I'm an engineer. Um, I'm very data driven. I, and so I already have a set of parameters on my bike. I'm very familiar with the concept of cycling with power. Um, most of my bike training is on a smart trainer in my garage, and a lot of my structured workouts are based on power output. Um, so when I saw those first Facebook ads on Stride and it was advertised as a parameter for running, I immediately knew what that meant, and I immediately knew what that could give me. Mm. Um, Can you talk a little bit more about what you thought it could give you and why the concept maybe... Um, of power in general coming from the bike makes sense because yeah. talking about wattage on the bike, it just has been established for years and years and years. But what in your mind kind of clicked for you that you said, yes, this, this immediately makes sense to me and I can see the value in running. Um, steady power output, regardless of whether you're going down a hill, up a hill on the flats. Um, it prevents you at the beginning of a race, it prevents you from going out too hard. Um, it really gives you a tangible metric to make sure that you're not burning yourself out too early, it, leaving things in the tank, so to speak, for later. Um, and especially on a course like the Austin Half, uh, um, if you're not familiar with it, the first 5K is all uphill. The second 5K is all downhill. And the final 5K is all rolling hills culminating in that big hill at mile 12. Um, and I knew from my experience the year before, I knew that I went out too hard. And I knew that by the time that I got through the ends of all those hills, I was completely spent. Um, so then the idea of being able to run with power, I knew that that would prevent me from making all of those mistakes. Mm -hmm. What was your training block like leading up to your half marathon PR? Can you tell us a little bit um, without revealing all the secrets from the uh, Purple Patch Fitness in case people want to check that out for themselves and get, get those plans and coaching, but what was your training block generally like leading up to that half marathon? Um, the training... If you go back a month before Austin, there is another half marathon in the Austin community called the 3M. Um, and up until the 3M, I was mainly following my triathlon programs, quote unquote, baseline program. Um, I was cycling usually three to four times a week. I was running usually two to three times a week. Swimming as an onset, as an adult onset swimmer, 
I need every bit of time in the pool that I can get. So I swim during most of my lunch hours. I need every bit of time in the pool that I can. Mm. Um, so at the 3M, um, 3M is a course with a net downhill. And so I finished it in a 155. Um, it was it, it was easy. I mean, it was net downhill. Um, but I knew that Austin was going to have a lot of hills. And so then every Sunday I supplemented my existing tri training. Every Sunday I would go out and do hill training. And that really helped. What type of hill training would you say? Because it is interesting if you talk about a race like the 3M half mm -hmm. marathon, like you said, has net downhills. Practicing running downhill can be just as important as running those uphills, but you can't just do the specific, you know, downhill work. You have to run up the hills as well. But then for a oh, hilly yeah. course, for a course like Austin, if you have rolling hills, it still means you have the downhills. So um, yeah. what in your mind uh, did you think would help you maybe specifically prepare? Was it hitting a power target? Was it hitting a effort? Was it hitting a certain length of a hill to make you feel more confident? What was your kind of idea and approach there? Um, it was mainly duration. As far as the first week, I, it was mainly 30 second intervals, um, 30 seconds up, a minute down. Mm -hmm. um, the second week, it was 50 seconds up, a minute and a half down. Um, third week, I think it was 75 seconds up. Um, and the downhills it was walking downhill basically until my heart rate recovered, and then it my, then it migrated to jogging downhill. Mm -hmm. um, and it was inter it's interesting that you point out specifically training downhills because that's one thing that the concept of training uphills. Yeah, everyone struggles on the uphill, so that's what they think about. But training downhills is equally important. Um, at Austin this year, for example, I knew that, you know, the opening 5K is all uphill, so I took it nice and slow, and everyone's passing me right and left. The second 5K is all downhill, um, and the training I did on just training downhills there, I was passing just as many people past me because they were all, you know, you don't want to overstride, you don't want to land on your heels, so they're, they're really slowing down to save their knees. Um, but the training that I did allowed me to just lengthen my stride a bit, keep leaning forward, careful not to land on my heels. And I ended up, you know, I ended up setting a 5K PR on that second segment just because it was all downhill and I knew how to manage that. Right. Totally. And you didn't go for a 5K PR in the first 5K no, of the half. So you absolutely could... not. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, the other thing that I was curious about was heading into race day. So you said um, the month previous when you ran the 3M half marathon, which was the net downhill, you ran about 155. Mm -hmm. And then coming up to Austin, you knew the course profile. Yes. And you might have had some tools in your back pocket that you could have used to get a little bit more specificity. Like you mentioned, you ran a certain uh, prescribed wattage. I think 226 was what you said. Can you yeah. tell us about maybe the week of or a day or two before race day, how you prepared to hit a goal target for the specific course you were preparing for? And then maybe how that target compared to the end result? Um yeah, even if I back up more than a few days before the race, I did look at Stride's race prediction tools. Um, I did have a um, fit file of the course, and so I fed that into the race prediction tool along with Stride's knowledge of my critical power, and they gave me a target of 226 watts specifically on that course. Mm -hmm. And they said that I would finish in a 157.30, and then leading up to it, I shuffled around some of my tri training to, you know, given the course of the training week, I moved all the hard sessions to the early part of the week. So I gave myself a bit of a taper, um, you know, really watched my nutrition a few days before just to make sure that I was eating what I needed to be eating. 
Um, and then leading into it, you know, remember I said that the race prediction tools said 157.30 um, at 226 watts. I averaged 221 watts and I finished in 157.33. So Stride software tools were accurate to within three seconds over the course of a two hour event. Amazing. And yeah. I will also say the the tools are fantastic. It requires the good data in, good data out. But an athlete like yourself, you were the one that ran it and yes. you set yourself up well. And that's the thing that I really like to highlight too, especially with a case like this. The race result is a culmination of that 13.1 miles or that one hour, 57 minutes, 33 seconds. But it's also all of that training going into it. It's those little adjustments and tackling, um, you know, some hill work or doing a half marathon on a more net downhill uh, course a month before to get your legs prepared to run that fast. It's that holding back in the first 5K. So yeah. a success story and a highlight is actually the culmination of like all of that training and even that whole year previous oh, sure. too. Um, so I think it's absolutely amazing that the tools are... Um, great and they help not give any reason to hold you back necessarily it just lets you capitalize on all of the fitness that you have and provided that you're prepared you have good data in good data out it yes. lets you have a fantastic result so when you crossed the finish line and you had run you know five minutes faster on that course specifically than the year before was that a goal in your mind that you knew you specifically wanted to tackle that? And then maybe did it unlock another goal that you thought you might not have been able to accomplish in the future and it kind of changed your outlook on a future goal you might want to have? Um, well, all of the running that I've been doing, of course, follows into the triathlon training that I do. Mm -hmm. And all of, the, all of these are stepping stone events leading up to larger triathlons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the next one on my schedule, for example, is the Ke the Keptex try in Austin on Memorial Day. Um, knowing that I can break two hours in a half marathon does raise the question of, you know, how much faster I can run next year. Um, but it also does. Right now, I'm looking at Ironman 73 Waco in the fall. Um because I've right now all of my triathlon experience has all been middle distances, like Olympic distance at the most. I've never done a half Ironman. And so the first step in knowing that I would be able to complete a half Ironman is the, you know, first, are you capable of biking the 90K? Are you capable of running the 13.1? Well, I know that I can do both of those. Mm -hmm. um, now it's mainly just an issue of getting my swim in shape. <laughs> sure. And that's where the lunch breaks come in too. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for your upcoming half Ironman, it's Memorial day. You said is the, the next event. And then uh, the one Memorial day is an Olympic distance, the Olympic. And that's in preparation for the 70.3 in Waco. Yeah. Um, do you have like a big scary goal that ideally, uh, you know, hidden somewhere in the back of your head, you say it would be great to finish around this sort of time or is the goal now get through the swim and then see how you do on the bike and then see how you do on the run leg or what's your mindset there? Having never done a 73 before, I really don't have a specific time goal in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, six hours would be amazing, but I'm not sure that I can get my swim in shape to hit that time. Sure. Um, and, and even then, that would be a two-hour half marathon after the swim and after the bike. Right. Um, practically speaking, I don't think that's attainable right now. Mm -hmm. um, simply finishing at this point really is the main goal that I have. And then I can begin working on refining my time maybe for Texas next year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to thank you again for coming on and sharing oh. your success story. You had posted initially in our Stride Facebook community, which is around yes. 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. I guess my last 
question is what motivated you to share your story? Because like I, I said at the very top of the show, um, every day, every weekend specifically, once the weather tends to get nicer and it's more racing season, there are you know, so many posts that flood in and it is so inspiring to me every single day to see people talk about just their general successes. And yeah. that is so inspiring and so motivating. What motivated you to want to share your story? Um, well, two things. Um, the first one is just given my experience of last year versus this year, the contrast between the two was so dramatic that, you know, I've been a fan of Stride ever since I began running with it, but the difference was just so striking that I figured, hey, people need to see this. Um, and the second thing is that, again, as a scientist, um, results and data really are useless unless you share them with other people. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of hold this up and say, see, this really works and look at because it I still do not look at myself really as an accomplished endurance athlete. I've only began running, you know, not even three years ago. Um, but if I can do this, then I'm sure that there are other people out there that might not be, you know, if they need encouragement, they can at least look and say, well, if he can do it, maybe so can I. Absolutely. Um, I feel so inspired talking to you and it's thank amazing you. to hear your journey and your success story. I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us and well, share you. your whole message and stuff. We will put more information about some of the resources you talked sure. about in the description and show notes so people can take advantage of those too. Um, but I just want to say thank you again and best of luck in the upcoming training and triathlons and your debut at the 70.3 distance. Yeah. Well, thank you for